Hey, hey, everybody. Good Saturday afternoon or evening or morning or Sunday morning or wherever you are. Hey, how are you doing? Uh, welcome to today's talk. We're just going to be talking about dehydrating all of your questions, anything that you want to share of things that you've been doing lately, uh, just chatting with each other in the comment section. I uh, just want to say hey, and let's do some chat about dehydrating, shall we? All right. So first of all, let me remind you, uh, this is going to end tonight. So those of you who might be watching this later know that this will no longer be valid. But the giveaway for the two Kasori dehydrators, there's a 10 tray and a six tray that are being given away, plus $150 cash to someone who does not live in the U.S. so that you can purchase your own dehydrator. That ends tonight, okay? That ends at midnight uh, U.S. time. So, um it is the last video that I did, it, the Kasori. Uh, it's the 100,000 subscriber giveaway image right now. It's the last video that I've done on the channel. So make sure that you go there and enter, okay? I want everybody to get a chance to win one of those two, whichever one that you want. Um, okay, so the business is done. Let's get on to the chat, shall we? So uh, welcome. I'm glad that you're here. I appreciate you being here. Uh, I'm glad that we can get together and chat about this kind of stuff. Something I mentioned in that video last time was the fact that we have so many people who are coming to talk about making food mummies. And I got quite a few laughs about that um, from friends and from people in the comments about the fact that, yes, in fact, that's what we're doing. We're making mummies out of food. So uh, it just astounds me that we have so many people here who are wanting to learn about that and who know and have knowledge to share. Um, it just excites me that that, that that this community has happened and I'm just gobsmacked by it. Okay, so let's get started, shall we? So, hey, welcome. How are you doing? So share the last dehydrating project that you had in your machine, the last one you did or what you're about to put in, but share what you're working on right now. I'm going to go through the, the, the comments real quick and catch up with everybody because I know there were some questions that came in before we went live. All right. Heather Lawless asks, do I know, how do I know how much silica pack to use? It doesn't matter. Uh, silica packs aren't the same as O2 absorbers where there is a, an amount you have to have to make things work correctly within the container. I tend to go with a five gram packet. This one happens to be a three, um, but I use a five gram because it covers everything. I just buy the one size and I never have to worry about it again. If I'm using a really big jar with something I'm concerned about, I'll throw two in because it's not going to harm anything to use too many. Uh, it's not going to harm anything to use too few. Uh, they can be recharged so that if you find out that it's already absorbed, what it's going to absorb, throw it back in your dehydrator for a while and it will be fine. You can use it again. So this doesn't really matter, but I just stick with one number so that I've got all the bases covered. Two grams might work for you. Three grams might work. I just stick with five and I've got everything. Uh, with O2 absorbers, uh, it matters because they can only absorb so much of the oxygen within a certain amount of space. Uh, and off the top of my head, uh, you cannot pull up the numbers. But if you go and look, um, I, I may be able to pull up in a minute. But there is a moisture absorber versus oxygen absorber video on my channel that's about storing dehydrated foods. I talk about it there. But if you go to my uh, website, um, thepurposefulpantry.com slash storing dehydrated foods. Um, that will give you a chart that you can print off that you'll have those numbers for the oxygen absorbers. So I hope that helps, um, but that's all there is to these. I mean, I don't use oxygen absorbers ever anymore. I just happen to keep some here for people who ask questions. Um, I find them unnecessary, uh, but I know that people like to use them for insurance. So, um, but this is what I use. If I'm gonna use anything, it's a moisture absorber and the size doesn't matter. I hope that helped Heather. Okay, next question. Um, hey, Tammy Lee, how are you? Um, well, Jennifer, have fun walking your dog. Um, let's see. Hi, Tammy. Hi, Christine and Kathy and Mary, uh, the No Dig Gardener. Hi, hey, how are you? Um, let's see. Hey, AJ and Hope and Victoria. Let me see if I've got some other questions down here that have popped up. Um, oh, green onions. Mary green onions are so easy. I love doing them because they're just like chop them, throw them in. Don't even have to worry about them. They'll dry. They'll be dry fast. They're going to be good. Okay. Somebody's doing pumpkin powder. Um, that is what my next project is. We did not grow pumpkins. Um, we tend not to grow them here because they take up so much space. We don't have it. Um, and we didn't do a garden this year that could survive. So what do I do in the meantime when I'm out of pumpkin powder and I don't want to go spend the extraordinary amount of money that pumpkins are costing right now? I find an incredible deal at the grocery store and I have 13 of these puppies ready to go in my dehydrators to make pumpkin powder for the year. Um, and 13 may not be enough, but um, this is what you can rely on. If you can't grow your own 
or your crop failed or your farmer's market doesn't have them. Or like right now, um, I can get those really big jack lantern pumpkins for about four bucks from a couple of places. But um, I tend to like to use sugar and other kinds. And those are really expensive this year. I went to go price them last night and I'm not paying those amounts. So I found a screaming good deal on this um, for now, you know, three years ago, this wasn't a screaming deal, but for right now it's a screaming deal. So I'm going to be drying this like crazy. Um, and I do have a video on the channel from last year, the year before that I did it for you on the, on the thing there. I may do another one, um, but that's what I'm working on for mine. Uh, but I also have butternut squash, uh, sweet potatoes and onions all in line, ready to be processed. So that'll be what I start working on this week. Um, let's see. Um, for eye vision, fourth eye vision, uh, you do not recharge oxygen absorbers. They are once and done. Once you've used them, um, you might get some that are like this that are really hard or they may have gotten hot. You can feel that they got hot. Uh, once they've used, you've got to toss them. These can just be thrown on your dehydrator trays and thrown in your dehydrator for half an hour and it will it will dry out the little silica, the silica gels that are on the inside. It takes out the moisture. You put them back in an airtight container to store and they're good to be used again. It's really easy. You can do it in the oven as well. Um, set on like 200. I wouldn't do it too hot just because who knows what it could do to it, but uh, you can just put them in there for a while too and they will dry out. They're super easy and great to reuse, which is one re other reason why I like them is they're no waste. Okay. Ooh, oranges and lemons. Awesome. They're really, they, they taste really good. So that, you know, in case you see why I'm off looking up, um, my camera and my laptop are right here, but my big screen where I can see things is just right here above us. So I have to look up there to read things because it's a little harder for me to read down here in the comments. So um, I'm looking at you, I'm, but I'm reading you up there. Okay. Um, let's see what else. Let's see, can I use pumpkin powder versus flour in baking and how do you use them? Jennifer, no vegetable powders really replace flour in most recipes because you don't have gluten and most of those recipes require gluten to work. So what you can do uh, is sort of like with zucchini flour, you can do about a third of a cup uh, in a recipe to try to replace some of the flour, but you're not gonna be able to replace it all. If you're doing it in pasta, you wanna add a little bit at a time just to try to see what your, your uh, I keep wanting to say batter, uh, but what your dough is like, you're not really using it to replace the flour and you're using it just to add nutrition and color. Um, but with, but it doesn't really replace flour. Um, it just is an enhancement. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense that it, it enhances your flour, gives you a, an opportunity to replace some of it, uh, but not all of it. Um, but you can use it to replace puree for making things like pumpkin muffins and all those kind of things that you would make with pumpkin. You don't need the puree. You can just get your um, powder, mix it with as, as much water as it requires for you to get a consistency that you need. Um, and then that will replace the puree that you might've had on the shelf. So that's the one good thing is I love using pumpkin for a lot of things, but I don't want to store this much pumpkin on my shelf all year long. So I powder it and it's useful all year. Okay. Um, um, do I have to powder my dehydrated pumpkin or can you leave it in chunk form once it's dehydrated? Tammy, you can go ahead and just leave it in the, in the leather form. Um, that's fine because that's actually a better way to store it over time because you're not going to lose as many nutrients like that optimal storage thing that happens. Powders are about six, six months, nine months or in that range. You start losing things. Uh, if you keep it the fruit leather, it kind of stays better, uh, but you can do it either way. Well, however that works for you. Um, Tiny, a lot of people use butternut squash because it's, it's a replacement for pumpkin. And on a lot of the um, a lot of the the cans of this kind of stuff, often if it doesn't say it's pure pumpkin, and sometimes I still think they use that to you know to meet any of them, it's winter squash. That's what they really mean. So it's any of the orange winter squashes. So it could be pumpkin, it could be butternut squash, it could be uh, there's like four or five different varieties that are grown for that. So any it can be used for anything. Um. AJ, just like I said, with reconstituting pumpkin, it's mixed with enough water to get to the consistency that you want to use. So, um, because of course, now that I have to draw it up, I can't remember. Uh, if you go to my website, um, I've got the ratio down there in a little graphic that you can copy, but I want to say, I don't remember. I can't, I can't pull it up right now. Um, and it would be, well, let me look it up real quick. Um, If I could spell correctly, that would help. But if I spell correctly, then you would know it's not me. Um, pumpkin. 
somebody may already have it there too. So uh, dehydrated pumpkin, maybe pumpkin powder, jump to the recipe. And it is, I need to add that to it. And I don't have an, oh, there it is. Okay, so it's about one half cup of powder to about two cups of water. But again, the thing about this is, is that it will depend on your powder. So it depends on the humidity in your in your home. It depends on the distance of the powder. So you can put it in, you let it sit and let it rehydrate. And then you adjust from there. So if it's too watery, you can add a little bit more powder to make it not so watery. If it's too thick, you add a little bit more water to make it less thick. So it's just going to be kind of like making dough where you have to adjust based off what your outcome is when it's finally done reconstituting. Then you say, oh, then we have to make adjustments from there. If it needs it, you may be happy with where it is and it's fine. Okay, um, let's see. Tammy also asked, do you have to powder your dehydrated pumpkin? Or Oh, that's you already did that. I thought that was a second question. Sorry about that. Um, what do I use pumpkin powder for? Watchman on the wall to replace puree. And that way I don't have to keep cans of it here. Uh, I wouldn't be able to store whole pumpkins here year round. So I would have to preserve it some, play, some way. You can use it to put into pasta uh, to make uh, pumpkin pasta. So not just the, the pumpkin sauce, but the actual pot, the pasta can be orange and have a pumpkin flavor. Um, you can do pumpkin and Alfredo kind of sauce to make it a pumpkin sauce for things like maybe you're going to do butternut squash tortellini and you can actually make a kind of butternut squash slash pumpkin powder. I mean, pumpkin sauce to go on it. Um, you can make all of the breads and everything that you would typically might make this time of year. You can make Rice Krispies treats with it. You can do that and have pumpkin ones. Um, there's just all sorts of things that you can do that make waffles, make uh, a pumpkin, uh, let's see, a pumpkin coffee mix, which is also on my site. I've got a thing about waffles and pumpkin powder on the site. So there are tons and tons of ways you can use it. Um, let's see. M Michelle asked, what's my favorite food to dehydrate? Favorite versus useful. I'm practical. My favorite is going to be greens because we don't eat cooked greens in our house. We really don't like them. Spinach in some pasta dishes is one thing. Uh, eating a side of slimy spinach next to something is not something any of us like. Um, and so uh, greens is the way that I can get cooked greens in our family forever and do it. So that's my favorite thing to do because it's useful and practical. I mean, I'm not going to want to just sit around and eat it. Um, let's see. Um, then we have, um, why is it that your nose, it just really badly when the point that you can't like get away and go get a Kleenex and take care of it. It's just like, Oh, it's itchy. Um, then we have, um, mushroom powder. Um, I'm not a big fan of rehydrated, dehydrated mushrooms. So, um, they have, a kind of rubbery texture that I'm not really fond of. And my youngest son is always also the same way. So using mushroom powder, we love the flavor. We just don't like that texture. And so mushroom powder is one of those things that I do a couple times a year to make sure we have enough in stock all the time. Um, I, I have come to love tomato chips these last couple of years because I don't eat fresh tomatoes very much except on it on a like in something or on a hamburger or something like that. I just won't slice a tomato and eat it. But these tomato chips with some seasonings on it, so, so, so yummy. All right. So then now we have, um, Hey, Eric, Erica, Oh, Erica from Morocco. Well, welcome. I think that's the first time we've had anybody from Morocco here. Um, Let's see, Marcella Munoz, Munoz asked about dehydrating, uh, bananas. Yes, you can, but here's some tips. Do not do overly ripe bananas. Uh, because they can get really sticky. They don't dry well. Give them tons and tons of time. When you think they're done, they're not done. Give them more. If you want that crisp where you can break it and it's dry, it's going to take a while to get there. Now, some people also will do them lengthwise. Instead of in coins, they'll actually slice them in length and actually might enjoy those better. And some people also do banana fruit leathers. So, um, if you want good bananas, don't use the ones that are like brown and really spotty and soft. Those are best to go ahead and just put in the freezer for bread and for baking with. Okay, let's see what else. Daniela just did her very first green powder. Cannot wait to start using it tonight. Also got more apples and uh, mixed vegetables. That's great. Glad you're getting into it. Um, Allison, the favorite 
treat to make for a four-year-old, whatever that four-year-old likes to eat now, and get them involved with you to do it. Don't just make them and hand it to them. Get them involved with you. Cut up some bananas with them and let them put them on the trays. Apple uh, apple slices are great. Um, let's see. You can make fruit leathers out of just about anything. And a help for that will be to blend it with a little bit of applesauce because that natural pectin helps keep it softer. Uh, and it makes things sweeter that might turn kind of sour or bitter in a fruit leather. Um, but let's see. Um, if you keep it to fruit, those would be good. Um you can do marshmallows if you're into doing those kind of things with your kids because marshmallow treats are like these little soft, crunchy pillow things that just shatter your mouth and they can be a fun treat. But if you're not into that for your kids, then don't do that one. Um, but uh, let's see what else we have on there. It's I'm trying to go down the list of the kids things that I have to help get kids involved. And it's apples and uh, cherries are good. I really like cherries. I'm not sure how you're yeah, cherries, but they take a while, uh, but they can taste really good and they're different. They're like raisins, but not. Um, they can be really good. So it's experimenting with what they already like to eat and then just involving them. I think that will help them like things a whole lot more. All right, let's see what else. Um, oh, Jennifer pumpkin gnocchi. I would. I haven't made that yet. I've never made gnocchi before, but I would love to, but I buy it because I have a place where I can get it. So I buy it every year. Um, let's see, just to head the last of the cherry tomatoes for the season. Thanks so much for enlightening me in this option. Pamela, great. I'm glad because that's a great way to keep that fresher flavor, uh, during the year when you can't normally get really good tomatoes, you know, but you still got yours that you, you grew and that you got ready to use. Okay. Let's see. I almost made mushroom powder for my husband. Uh, Mousy says, I almost made mushroom powder for my husband and was glad you mentioned allergies in the household and not to do them for my husband because I'm highly, if you're allergic to mushrooms, Mousy, I wouldn't do mushrooms at all. I would stay away. Definitely. Um, let's see. Randy, make fruit leather with leftover cranberry relish. Definitely. Um, we take the cranberry uh, because I like the jelly cranberry better than I like the fresh cranberry. Sorry. I'm that person who loves the canned stuff with the little lines in it and everything. Uh, and I take little um, cookie cutters and cut things out of it and then dry them. And they're like little fruit, cranberry fruit gummies. And they're really good. <clears throat> hey, Leslie, welcome to live. Glad to have you here. Um, yep. And dehydrating, unlike canning, is one of those things where you can walk away which is one thing about canning that you really can't do safely. You can't just set everything up and then go to another part of the house and stay there for a while. Dehydrating is so hands off that I think it makes a really great introduction into uh, preservation in general. Uh, if you want shelf stable things, um, there's just this learning co curve for people to learn that you just have to dry things longer than you think. Don't ever stop drying them. Don't, don't go by the book, go by when it's dry. Um, let's see, Doris, I mentioned earlier, I don't know if you caught it. Yes, you can do banana powder, but you need to use things that are less ripe. So the, the bananas that are still, I wouldn't say green, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't go with that spotted, uh, soft banana. They're way too ripe and they will not make a good powder for you because it will clump like crazy because of the sugars that have been developed in that ripening process do not make them a good choice for a good candidate for doing powders. Um, I know that people do it, but I would just stay within that really kind of hard ripe stage. Does it, you know what that one I'm talking about? The kind of ripe that it's ripe, but they're not necessarily pleasant to eat because they're not, they don't have that toothy bite yet or that softness yet. Yeah. Stay with that. That range will help a lot. Okay. Let's see. Um, yeah. No, no dig gardener. Yeah. Tomato powder is awesome stuff. And it's so versatile and it's got like thousands of uses. So it's, it's worth doing. Um, P, P, uh, P, P, L, J, P, L, J. Um, can you do cuties? Yes, you can. Okay. For those of you who don't know what a cutie is, it is a small little mandarin orange. It's just the little small oranges. Okay. They're usually pretty easy to peel because they've been bred to be able to peel away easily. If you're going to do them here, are a couple of methods. Okay. You take the segments and you cut down, not where it's connected here, but the wider side and cut down the back side of it to slice it up open, okay, to let the moisture out. And then you can actually open that up where it's still connected at that hinge point and you have these little slices of mandarin without actually having to cut through and make slices, but it just kind of leaves you with this little butterfly, okay? You can do it that way. 
other people actually do down the hinge side and open it back up and it actually looks like a butterfly. Uh, my way just makes it easier and it's a little circle, but um, you can do that way or um, you can actually slice through just like you would a regular orange. Um, so there's a three ways. You can either just leave it as a whole slice, but just remember if you do the slice, the segments and only slice or cut open any of that mem membrane, they are going to take a good long time to dry. So you will look at them and think, gosh, they're dry. The outside's dry. It looks all dry, but you need to cut one open and open it up and see if there's still moisture inside those cells, because that's where it's going to catch it. Um, is that if it's not dry all the way through, they will mold from within over time on the shelf. So make sure they're all dry. Can you scroll back up here real quick? Sharon, kids seem to love those dried marshmallows, don't they? They are a treat, um, and even my big guys like them on occasion. Um, why would my, okay, Sharon, S Sandra asked, why would my tomato leather mold on the bottom? When did it mold? Did it mold in the dehydrator? Did it mold on the shelf after you put it up? If it mold on your dehydrator, it means that it was in there too long and it wasn't working. Um, it drying at a high enough temperature to kill that off and you didn't flip it. Um, what you want to do with most fruit leathers is as they're drying and the top has got a pretty good dry on it and you can actually pick it up and turn it over, you want to turn it over because it will help it dry more efficiently. And it sounds like yours may have sat there for too long, wasn't drying, uh, did, you, did it sit there without the machine being on for a while? I mean, that's what it sounds like to me. That would be the only way that it would mold because it got stuck there and it could not dry the underside and thus it molded over time. All right, uh, let's see what else. And um, I answered Doris. Um, hey, Norma, great to have you here. Christy, I'm glad you found the book helpful. Um, that was my wish that it would be a really good helpful book that you could take a ton of notes in that it would give you ideas um, and that it was the kind that would help people along. Cause I know that in most dehydrating books that are out there, there's no room to put notes. And so you can't like do it and do it again and come up with different experiments the way you want to try things without having to keep notes elsewhere that can get lost and stuff. So I'm glad that you're finding it helpful. Okay. Let's see. Hey, Homestead Chile, how are you? I'm glad to have you here. Um, Let's, okay, um, Randy said, I tried to make tomato powder dehydrating tomato sauce. I got tomato leather. Well, from that point, when you get your leather really good and crispy, so it's really dry and brittle, then you powder it. So you can take a grinder, and I didn't bring, I didn't set up one here. You can take a, a coffee uh, grinder. You can take a bullet blender like you make smoothies in. Uh, or depending on how much you made, you can use an actual big blender that's got a good, a good motor in it, and you make powder from that. And that's how you get the powder. Nothing will turn into a powder in the dehydrator. You actually have to grind it after. Um, Tanya, 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 not sure which way you pronounce it, says that she likes dehydrating over canning because it's a huge space saver. And it is. Petty Cake says, I used to buy cranberries during the holidays and would can them to make cranberry juice. If I dehydrate the berries instead to save space, will I be able to make juice by dehydrating them? rehydrating them later. No, it won't work that way because what you've done is that the juice is the, the, all the flavor and stuff. So once you've done that, all you're going to be left with is the, no, you cannot make juice from rehydrated cranberries, unfortunately. Okay. It, it doesn't quite work that way because what you've done is you've already taken all the juice out of it uh, and there's nothing left. It's still got flavor. It's still worth dehydrating if you want to make powder from it or if you want to use it to bake with, um, but it's, you can't make juice out of it after that. You can make cranberry flavored water so you can infuse water with those, but it won't make juice again. Um, Okay, let's see what else. Um, can you dehydrate local honey out of a jar for storage? You can, but why ruin your honey? Why go through all the trouble? It's It will take you forever to dehydrate. It will not store well because it's going to be super sticky. And because sugar is a hygroscopic, I always have to remember how to say that. Hygroscopic means it's going to, it attracts moisture. So it's going to be like, that's why if you leave brown sugar where it's got a lot of uh, air in the jar, in the, in the container, it gets really hard. No, because it takes the sugar out. But uh, that's the other way. But sugars will attract a ton of moisture. And that's why fruit leathers can get sticky if they're not stored properly. Um, and so doing that is just going to create this uh, powder that's going to be clumpy all the time. And it will take you a long time to get there. 
there are honey powders that are on the market that are for, um, that are mostly sugar with some honey infused in it to make it taste like honey. But there are a few places who do sell a honey powder that is just honey. Um, it's kind of expensive, but if you want it for just small things, then that's how I would do it. But you can, but it's like, to me, local raw honey, why ruin it? Because once you put it in the dehydrator at that temperature uh, that it needs to dry well, you're killing off all the good properties of raw honey. So, and it stores forever on the shelf anyway. So there's really no point in doing it, but you can, so just be prepared. It's going to be sticky. And it's going to take you forever. Okay, let's see. Um, oh, no, no, no. LP says, I just finished cranberries that I left from canning cranberry sauce. I uh, I poked a hole and pressed gently. If I took them two full days or... Okay, try that. I, it still took two days to dry them. No, that's... it's Things take a long time, especially those whole fruits that are dense and are berries. So you could have cut them in half and that would have shortened the time um, if you were willing to take that kind of time to do it. But berries are, they have a, a harder case around them, unlike fruits that you cut up. Um, and you've got a little hole with a lot of moisture that's got to come out of those little holes if you don't like slice them open or if you haven't blanched them to break them open better. So just be patient because they take time, but it's worth the time to wait on them. Hey, Terry, how are you? Um, while Watson uh, asks, um, my marshmallow powder was all sticky. What did I do wrong? You don't do anything wrong when things work the way they're going to work. Okay. So um, let's see. I'm going to take this right here. This is some beet powder that I have left over. And as you can see, most of it is sticking. Okay. It's not coming apart. All right. So this is because over time, this little bit of moisture that is entrapped in it that's here uh, just makes this stick. It's got a lot of sugar in it natural sugars that are there. So those sugars will get sticky to each other, not sticky like sticky, but they start clumping each other. The pressure of the weight of this, the compaction that happens here will just cause them to stick over time. And I haven't opened this one in a while, so they've been allowed to settle and they just kind of get that way. All it will take for this to be fixed is for me to open the jar, take a fork, just run it through here and see what I'm doing. And I've got powder again. Okay, it's all powdered back up. Now, if I wanted to, I could throw in a moisture absorber, put it in there, and store it like this. And it would help control what moisture gets introduced into your jar every time you open it. It's going to be this way. But with marshmallow powder, you're talking to pure sugar, okay, with some little added things in there. So if it gets a little clumpy, go in with something and try to break it up. Uh, and then just run it through the same process that you would do before. But I find that if I keep it in a good airtight container, it tends not to get sticky, but it will also depend on the kind of marshmallow that you're using. Um, the flavored marshmallows tend to be worse than just plain white marshmallow powder. Uh, and even the peppermint, the peppermint one didn't stick as much to me as the other ones do. So the best thing to do always is store things whole for as long as you can, powder only what you need in a couple of months. And that's, that's, that's the best way to store things because then you don't run into those issues as much. Okay. I hope that helped. All right. The next question. Oh, nobody's late. Rice and You're here when you're here and we're glad to have you here. Or is Dumbledore, uh, not Dumbledore. I almost did it. <laughs> Sorry. As Gandalf says, a wizard arrives just on time. Um, okay. Oh, Janet, the book. Okay, so here's the book. Um, am I going to be able to get it without breaking everything? No. Oh, let's. Sorry, I've got it right here, but I've got something st stuck on top of it. Nope, don't, don't do what I think you're about to do. Okay. All right, here's the book. It is, this one is the easiest way to do it. It's the, no, and everything falls just like I thought it was going to. It's the Hydrating Basics, uh, the journal, and well, it's an journal for beginners, but it's for anybody. Um, but it's made basically is a book of, um, right here are tons of instructions on how to dehydrate and lots of places where you can take notes and, and put down, jot down questions that you might want to ask me later or somebody else that you know. Um, then there is a whole section on how to dehydrate things and then how to use them and how to store them. And then we've got all of the journal pages that are the things that you're dehydrating with all of the instructions on how to do it. Um, and uh, with the basics up here, then the instructions, some tips, 
and then other tips down here about how to use it, how to store it, um, maybe another way you might want to do things. Then down here on the bottom is a way for you to track the yield of your particular project. Because while I can tell you a yield, uh, it will be affected by maybe how you prepared something or um, like if, if you decided to do shredded carrots instead of uh carrot slices, the yields aren't going to be the same between the two. So that you got a chance to write the yields this way. And then there's all this space to take notes about like you tried it this way once, and then you want to try it this way the next time or whatever. Then, uh, and then that's like most of the journal is that way. And then here in the very back are recipes. Um, not a ton because this is not a recipe book. It's a journal on how to dehydrate. Uh, and hopefully this next year, there will be a recipe book that goes along with it. But um, so that's what's in here. It comes in a spiral format. Then it comes in a book format. And while the, the whole big book comes this way too, you can also buy just the journal portion. Like if you're like, don't need how to dehydrate in the general properties, you can just do just the journal. Uh, and it comes in like a spiral or a book. And then it also comes as an ebook. And then what I did with it when I first got, uh, got the PDF finished for the ebook, I went off to the printer and had a copy printed. So it's got the cover and it comes with um, a spine here if you use that kind of binder. And then all I did was I went through here and did <laughs> editing notes, you can see here. Um, then I did tabs to do all of the different areas. So it's like the fruits and herbs and vegetables and other projects and the recipes so that I could just quickly tab over to what I needed. So it's at thepurposefulpantry.com. Um, if you just if you go to the site, then up at the top, it's, there's a little shop tab that you can do, and it's there on the on the shop site. And it's also linked down in the description part of this video, not over here where the, the chat is, but down below. And actually, I can just do that, can't I? I keep forgetting that I can add things to it. Um, to here, and I'm going to put a drop a link right in there. Okay, so I hope that helped. Um, Let's see where else we are. I say that a lot, don't I? I'm done. I say, um, hey, Intentional Living, welcome here. Randy, to make leather crispy, you keep drying it. Okay, if it's really thick, you're going to want to flip it over. You may want to break it up. You may want to do whatever you can, and you just let it dry until you can crack it because that's the stage that you want to be in to store leather for powders. Um, making fruit leather to snack on, you know, you want it a little pliable. To make it for drying for storage, you want to keep it. If your intent is powdering, that's what you want. You want to get it as dry as you possibly can. Oh, I just missed it. It jumped. Sorry about that. I'm sorry, guys. I lost my space. My place here. It jumped a little fast and I missed some. Okay, Kobaming. Um, how come my dehydrated herbs come out brown and not pretty green as yours? I do them at 95F and watch it carefully. There are a ton of reasons why. It could be the kind of herb you're drying. It could be the fact that if you put them in wet, that seems to add to that. So when you wash them, you want to dry them off before you put it in your machine. It could be the fact that when you, uh, it, how, like when you pick them, um, it could be how old they were. I mean, there could be any variety of reasons. Some of mine come out brown. My basil sometimes comes out brown. My spearmint sometimes comes out brown. Um, it depends on the herb and it depends on so many other factors. It still tastes the same and it's still fine. So you're not, don't worry about it. Okay. If they get really brown and kind of gross, that's a little different, but there are just so many ways. Now, purists will tell you, don't ever put them in heat, put them, you know, hang them only ever um, or put them like, I happen to have a dehydrator that doesn't air only function. Um, but don't let them, don't let that, that be the thing that tells you that's the only way you can ever do it. Like here, I cannot hang anything to dry because of our environment. Um, and we don't have the place that it's not hanging in everybody's way all the time. Uh, because I don't have the kind of kitchen you can hang things in easily. And I don't want to put it over by the fireplace because it gets too super dusty. Um, and I just don't want to do that. So I'm I'm happy to go ahead and put it in a dehydrator. Now, the other thing is, is that yours may be drying a little hot. And if it is, then that may be an issue for you too. But there are a couple things that make that a problem. So try that next time, making sure they're fully dry before you put them in there to dry. That seems silly that you have to dry them before you dry them, but that can help. All right. Next question is, Oh, Sherry. Sherry has done 200 pounds of vegetables now on her shelf. And that's awesome. That's the way to do it. Now you're stored for a while. 
And, you know, some people have the goal of dehydrating for just having snacks or they just want to put some stuff away. Some of us have the, the idea of doing dehydrating to put stuff away for the year to make sure that we have food to get through the winter. Um, and so we all have different reasons to do it and different quantities will make our goals happy. Um, so congrats on all of you who are doing what you're doing. But for those of you who are storing to store, putting away that much food is really great. Um, Jennifer Klein asks for blueberry powder or any other powder, okay, any other powder from any berry or any fruit. She asks if it's better to make, uh, to put them on whole and dry them or to puree them. If your intent is to go to powder, then puree them first. My intent is rarely ever to go straight to powder because those things can be used to bake with. They can be used to put in oatmeal. They can be used to put in cereal. They can be used in so many ways that my intent is not often to go straight to powder. So I prefer to store them whole because that's where they're best stored. You keep the most nutrients over time. And I powder as I need them for that short span of time. But if your full intent is to go straight to powder, puree everything first because it will dry so much faster. Hey, C. Bass, you're not late. You're right on time. Welcome. Um, Katie, that honey powder that Amazon has is not actual honey powder. It's sugar with some honey flavoring. But for some people, that's fine, and that's good. Um, Suburban Hillbilly says, my dehydrator is almost worn out. Looking at new ones, prices have jumped like everything else. Um, Suburban Hillbilly, not to plug, okay? There's a giveaway on the channel. Go Go get to that video and put your entry in uh, as a new comment. Don't comment to my comment at the pinned to the top. Do a comment there. I'm giving away two dehydrators. Um, and as far as I don't know how big you're looking for, because I don't know what you need. But right now I still have the deal with Kasori that we're doing $130, uh, $128.99 for a six tray Kasori and, uh, and $249 for a 10 tray Kasori. Um, those are some deals they gave me, but I, there are deals to be had. If you can hold out till Black Friday, or that week right before, they're going to be deals on everything like crazy. Um, so if you can hold out for a little while longer, hold out. But if you need something right now, I've got those um, because I made that thing with Kasori to get us a better price all the all year long versus only a Black Friday price. So I was so grateful that they did that because that means that you guys get cheap dehydrators. Okay, um, let's see the next question. Um, Annette Roberts, I don't use moisture absorber. I mean, I don't use oxygen absorbers. Um, like I said in the very beginning, you might not have been here and that's fine. I use, um, I put it away. Where did I put it? Which thing did I put it in? I put it in a powder. If I'm going to use anything, I use a moisture absorber. That's what this is here. And that's what helps things stop sticking. That's what helps control moisture when you're opening and closing and opening and closing a jar. Every time you open it, you're introducing moisture into it. So I take the moisture absorbers for anything that I feel needs to have it, like fruit powders, some fruits, very rarely vegetables. Um, and I'll do that to store it. I don't use moisture. I mean, oxygen absorbers, they're not necessary doesn't mean you can't use them. They're good insurance. Um, the brands, um, I've got a link in the, uh, in the description box below to my Amazon store that has all the dehydrating tools that I use and they'll have in there the oxygen absorbers that I buy um, or the ones that I did buy just to have them, but I don't use them. Things like oxygen absorbers and moisture absorbers are there for insurance better than they are there to finish off a job for you. So you should never use them to kind of, people think they can put a moisture absorber in for things that aren't quite dry and it will take care of the rest of it. Never, ever, ever do that because it doesn't work that way. You might have more moisture in there than it can handle. And if it can't handle it quickly enough, you can still have mold. So use them as insurance down the way, not necessarily as the thing that's gonna save your food, okay? Um, so the brands that I use are there. I use Dry and Dry for moisture absorbers. That's my favorite brand. <clears throat> All right. So Claire Robertson says that uh, she's never tried dehydrating before. She inherited a dehydrator though. And so what's a good place to start? Claire, I'm going to tell you a good place to start is my website. There's a, uh, I'm going to put it in the, in the, in the notes for you right here. Okay. Let me get back to the home uh, the site, not the shop, the site. Um, this is going to be a good place for you to start because it kind of walks you through all of the ways to dehydrate. I'm going to have to do it from here. Sorry, trying to get this in for you really quickly. And again, my spelling and my keyboarding when I'm under pressure. Um, come on. 
computer is having a problem with that lately. There we go. I'm going to drop it here in the comments for you. It's the fact page that basically runs through every question that most people, most questions that people ask that are new to, to dehydrating, that you can start there and kind of give yourself a brief, like go down the questions and figure out which one that you need an answer to. But a good place to start is mixed vegetables that are frozen. Like just go buy a bag of frozen vegetables from the grocery store or a couple of bags of it and throw them on your dehydrator trays at 125 F and just let them go and they will dry. They they require no preparation. You don't have to do anything to, you don't have to blanch them. They are a good way to start and throw something in and just get a feel for what it's like to dehydrate. Then you turn around and use those in a super stew at some point during the winter and you've got ready-made dehydrated things that you don't have to prep for your soup. You just need to give them time to rehydrate and cook in the soup. That's the easiest, fastest thing to start with. Some people like to do apples. I never recommend bananas as being the first thing because they have such a high failure rate for folks who put them in and expect them to be like store-bought things. So I just don't recommend them being the first thing that you try. Let's see, everybody else, tell them, tell her what you think your favorite first projects might be for the dehydrator. Um, those are good, good starting places. You just slice some apples, dip them in a little bit of lemon juice, lemon water, bath, uh, and then throw them on your machine or don't dip them and just put some cinnamon on top and you'll never know if they oxidize. So those are good projects to start with. I need to get a sip of water here real quick. Welcome, who's your pioneer? Glad to have you here. Oh, Terry, do your tomato powder. I'm reminding you too. No dig, yeah. Uh, yeah, mixing up wizarding quotes. Um, we always joke about the memes that say, you know, don't believe anybody that you read on the internet, you know, love Abe Lincoln, those kind of things. Yeah, that's what I did. All right, so uh, Kathy says, I have ripe and green cayenne peppers. Can I dehyd dehydrate them whole? You sure can. And did I bring one handy? Because I thought that was one of the ones I was going to bring down with me. And no, I did not. Okay, so uh, cayenne peppers are small enough and they have thin enough walls that they're, they dehydrate easily. They may take you a day, but that's okay because you're wanting to keep them whole. What you can do if you don't care, if you want to lose the seeds because you're not going to use them later, you can just top them where you're taking off the green portion uh, and then just throw them on. While they dry, the seeds will dry and they will come out or you could just top, you know, tip them over when you're finished and the seeds will come out and you don't have to worry about it and then just store them whole. Um, what you don't want to do are really big, thick, uh, like peppers that have really thick walls and are larger. They will take forever to dry. You can do it. And something that you can do is just go down and slit the sides of it and it will help the moisture escape. And so that will dry better. Uh, but those smaller Peppers that are uh, thin walled are great for doing whole. Oh, rice or anything. So I'm glad you like it. I hope it's helpful if you do. Um, let's see. Erica, I'm glad that you think the book's good. Um, I really worried a lot over it because I kind of felt like when I was writing it, I, I looked at all the books that were out there and I kept saying, nobody needs another one of these. I have, a, a, um, I recommend two of them like crazy all the time. So there's, there's no need for me to put another book out. That's just like those. And I wanted to do something different. And I think many of you might've heard the story before. And if you did, if you have, I'm sorry, but I was approached last year to write a book. Um, by a publisher. And as we talked about the book, I kept realizing that the book was their book, not mine. It was what they wanted me to write. And it wasn't what I wanted to write. And eventually I turned them down because it's like, no, I don't want to write this book. It's not helpful to anybody. It's just another book for your inventory. And nobody's going to buy it because there are other ones just like it. And and there were some other reasons too, but that was the biggest one. So when I sat down and said, you know, what do I want to have happen? And what do I see happen in the community? It was like, this is what we need. This is what's not out there. It's, there's not a how-to book. That's a true how-to book. And it's not one that you can use and print off sheets, extra sheets if you need them. It's not one that you can, you know, write all your notes in. It's, it's that book that you need that lets you learn um, and lets you, uh, practice and let you experiment. And that's really what I wanted to put out there because it's totally different. Um, but the cool thing, I think it's going to be on Amazon by the end of the year. <laughs> okay, let's see. Um, 
I remain anonymous. Awesome. I'm glad that you find it helpful. Um, that was that was the hope is that people would. I just kind of felt like in the beginning that people go, oh, this is kind of lame. Why'd you do it this way? It's like because I think that's what the world needed. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's see. Oh, Sharon Jennings said that uh, she does citrus slices for simmering potpourri for simmering potpourri packages, and it takes a while to do it, but they come out so pretty. They do. Um, I still love, I still have mine from before because I haven't used a lot of them. It's about to be winter. That's when they're going to get used up when I do my tea. But uh, blood orange, limes, lemons, oranges, uh, mandarin oranges. And I think there's no grapefruit in this one because I think they were too big to fit in the jar. I had to do them separately. But they are wonderful. And when you first dry these, you want to dry them as low as you possibly can um, because they will turn dark pretty quickly. And these that are super dark are some that I also did some uh, experiments so I could show the difference about what they dried like at different temperatures, but they're still going to be good. They just, they just turn dark. But what does happen to these over time is they will turn darker. It's just the way that it happens, especially if you can't store in a completely dark place. Um, over time, they will turn darker, but that doesn't mean they're bad. It just means they turn darker. So they still will taste exactly the same. All righty. Uh, do this and stand there so you don't fall over. Next question. Wow, I'm so far behind on these guys. I'm sorry. I'll stop talking so much and just start answering questions. I tend to go like blah, 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 blah. Okay. Trying to dehydrate potatoes, but can't get the blanch time right. Then they turn to mush. Thicker, they they turn dark. Uh, Rebecca, um, there are some recommended times right here. I'm going to give you a link to another website who's done a, uh, a tutorial that I, I have yet to try to top. So I always send you over to her. So um, hopefully that helps you. Um, she gives you all the times to use. If it's super thin, you just don't want to do it so long. I wouldn't do it for more than three minutes ever for really thin slices. Um, so I hope that helps. It's going to be further down in the comments by the time you get to, I'm trying to catch up with you guys. Let's see. <clears throat> Okay, so Fourth Eye Vision asks, is it okay to use a food saver for air on a jar and use moisture absorbers together? Um, yes, because, <coughs> sorry, let me get a drink real quick, I'm sorry. You can use them together. It's not necessary because if you're in a vacuum sealed um, containment, no moisture is being introduced. So the moisture absorber is there and it's kind of useless to work with. If you're doing it to help finish off the process, then you're not doing the process correctly. So you don't really need to put a moisture absorber into something that you're vacuum sealing uh, unless, yeah, you just don't need to do them both. It's, it's, it's kind of like overkill and it's not necessary. Um, let's see. Somebody asks, okay, Sharon asks, I am new to dehydrating. I dehydrated cherry tomatoes. What's the best way to store them long-term? In a jar? Should you use moisture growers? Can I use a plastic container? Sherry, uh, the best way is condition your food first, which means that you put it into a jar. Uh, and of course, I don't have anything that I can show you. Okay, let's just pretend. Let's pretend that this is your cherry tomatoes. The best thing that you can do for all of your dehydrated foods as you're doing that is to dry them and then put them in a jar that's a little, a little bigger than what you've got. So because what you want to do is you want to move them around during like five to seven days. You want to do this once a day, go through and shake them up and look what happens. If over time you start to see things stick to the bottom of the jar that when you turn it over, they stick and this doesn't get them off that or they start creating clumps together in your jar where they are sticking to each other. If that happens, uh, we're going to do the next step in just a second. Or if you start to see moisture, like if you start to see little moisture bubbles here where obviously the, the environment is causing the moisture to come out of the fruit and, or food and come onto your jars or, okay, those things, you throw them back into your machine and you let them dry some more, then you do this again and then you store. Um, if you see mold, even if you see a little bit of mold hill, you need to throw away the whole thing. You can't go in and just take out that little piece and chuck it and think it's going to be okay. Because while you're seeing visible mold here, what's happening is that it's forming these little tendrils all through the rest of it that may be forming mold elsewhere that you can't see yet. So it's not good to eat food that's got mold in it. So uh, that's why we do conditioning is because a lot of people will dry things and think they're dry and then put them on their shelf and then wonder why two weeks later there's mold in the jars. And it's because things weren't dry enough. You can catch that ahead of time with conditioning. Okay, so you do that first. 
then an airtight container is all you need. Whether it's a glass jar like this, that's a canning jar that has a two piece lid that when you do this, it's, it's airtight. Whether you use like commercial jars that you might get in spaghetti, like with spaghetti sauce, or if you're using something that's airtight, that's all you need. Plastic containers, there are a couple of things to consider. Many plastic containers are really cheap plastic that don't have an airtight lip. So if you can squeeze it and you, you can feel air coming out of the lid, it's not airtight. Also, plastic over time is air permeable, which means that, that moisture and air can work its way through the plastic into it. So you have things like Ziploc bags that over time, things inside lose their crispness because it's, it's not airtight. It's permeable. Um, it's why when you put things in a plastic bag into the freezer and then you get, uh, you might get all of those crystals. It's because over time, either you put that in there and it was kind of warm or it, it loses its seal and it starts absorbing things in there and it starts creating that. So you have those issues with plastic. So what I recommend if you're going to use plastic is use a good hard rigid plastic like, um, and I don't have anything here that's close, like Tupperware or Rubbermaid um, containers or the Brilliance uh, or Progressive hard, the really hard plastic like the OXO containers, but don't use OXO containers for your dehydrated foods um, that have the clamp down lid that has a silicone thing on around it. So when you clamp it down, it creates an airtight seal. Anything like that can be used. You can just re recycle any con container that you have. Um, I just wouldn't use cheaper plastics and I wouldn't use Ziploc bags for things that are long-term storage. I hope that helped. Did it? Please let me know if I didn't. Okay, so um, T-bone, have I dehydrated red beets? Uh, I have, but I don't have any to show you. But yeah, they dehydrate just fine. You can either shred them now and dry them for powder, or you can bake them or boil them and cook them all the way through, which is what's recommended for all root vegetables, is to blanch them first at least, or at least cook them or cook them through. Uh, and then you can do what you wish with them after. Slice them, cube them, however you want to do it. At, like all vegetables, 125. Okay. Speaking of which, we're going to do a giveaway really quickly. Okay. No, we're not. Let's, let's hold out. Cause I got to answer some questions first or I will lose them and never get back to them. Uh, but we'll do a giveaway at the end. So hold on. Um, is it okay to use a food server? I answered that one already. Um, have I ever made my own tea blends? Jennifer asked. No, I don't because I buy them because I like to have too many different ones. And I also don't grow the things that would need to make the tea with. Um, so I don't do them. Um, thanks, Melissa. I appreciate that. Um, Oh, keep back and grow. Good on the tomatoes. That's awesome. Uh, Meriwether Magpie, you're welcome. Thank you very much for those comments. I appreciate it. Um, let's see. Sorry, trying to catch the comments and the questions. Um, who's your pioneer? Yeah. Old, old ones were really loud and they dried at one temperature, which was to do jerky. So they're really, they can over, they don't over dry things. Like you can't over dry things, but they can overheat things because of that one temperature. Um, sounds like you might need to upgrade pretty soon. Uh, but if it's working for you, then, then keep using it. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, Seabass is drinking her tea with some lemon slices that she dehydrated. That's awesome. That's how I use it most. Um, let's see. No, did Gardner she found that no matter what I did, my cherry tomatoes and slices for my beef, uh, beef, uh, beef tomatoes, I guess, just stayed sticky. I think this may be because of our humidity. So do I powder? I powdered them and finished it. So I powdered them and finished them off in the oven. That's exactly how you should do with it. Um, now, the sticky part. The, I question that only in, is it staying sticky after you fully dried everything and stored it? Or is it that you feel like you can't get them dried enough? Because sometimes that storing it, cooling it, sorry, drying it, cooling it, storing it. And then when you open it a lot, you may need to use some moisture absorbers in your containers because that's where your humi humidity is really going to affect it the most once you've got it fully dried. So maybe try that and it might help. Okay, let's see. Uh, Patricia, so what do you tell your friends who ask what's the first thing to hydrate? What do you tell them? I always say mixed vegetables because it's so easy to do and it's a it's kind of foolproof. Um, and so I always use that one first. And most people will use them in something, sort of. So um, let's see.
Yeah, here's your Pioneer. That's what moisture absorbers do. They are rechargeable and you can use them all, all the time. Uh, Caribou, thank you. How much applesauce do I add to fruit leather? Christine asks. Uh, I eyeball it. I don't measure it. I just do maybe, I don't know. I just eyeball it. I just put some in with whatever I'm working on. So I might do like maybe to a couple of cups of puree, I might add a half a cup of applesauce. Um, really, it's it's one of those things that I don't have a recipe for. I just kind of eyeball. You can't put too much really, unless you're trying to not, I don't know, just play with it. It'll work. Um, let's see. I do not, uh, let's see, Randy says, I don't dehydrate fresh taters. I dehydrate frozen so much easier. Yeah, that could be for you. Um, I just don't freeze tomatoes. Um, taters, you're saying potatoes. Yep. Uh, but you can't always get fresh taters. Potatoes. Yeah. Um, you can't get slices. Can you get slices very easily where you are? Because I don't remember seeing slices frozen um, where I am. But you can definitely do hash browns and cubes. No problem. Um, um, Charmaine says, I dehydrated a bunch of, I'm in a bag of frozen leeks and half of them have turned brown. Can I still use them? Okay. So tell me how they turn brown. Did they turn brown in the dehydrator or did they turn brown in storage over time? Um, and how were they frozen? Did you freeze them after, after, uh, harvesting them and didn't blanch them? Um, or did you buy them frozen from the store, which means that they were already taken care of? Now, also, are you using a stackable machine? And those top layers, the ones that brown, which means you need to rotate your trays more. Um, did you dry them too hot, which would be like 135 or 140 or 160? That could be the cause of it. Um, where are you storing them in some, uh, are you storing them in light, which they should be stored in, in darkness if you can. I mean, there are a lot of things that can change that. Um, but yes, they're fine as long as they don't, uh, as long as it's not mold um, and I wouldn't worry about it. The, the reason for blanching is mostly for uh, color retention, for nutrient retention and those things that have um, like there's a thing called oxalic acid in greens that when you blanch them, it takes away that acid and so that your body can absorb those nutrients better. So for some things, you want that when you're preserving it because you don't want to put it in raw. That doesn't mean you can't eat those things raw because you eat raw greens all the time in salads. But uh, over time, especially if you're eating the same kind of green all the time, that stuff can build up in your system and it's not good. For some things, it helps protect the, uh, the vegetables from turning color in, in the nutrients because um, it stops the enzymatic process that makes food go bad on your shelf. So like um, it's what happens to food over time. And so the enzymes that are in vegetables that when you put them in fresh and you dry them, that enzyme doesn't go away. And so it's gonna make your food degrade faster once on the shelf. So it will turn things like cabbage brown faster. Leeks may be doing that for you. Um, and so you might wanna think about blanching them I know you said frozen, but since I don't know which one you did, that could be an option for you too. So, but brown, they're fine. Basically what you want to do is test it. Would I eat it? If I'll eat it, then it's fine to use. If I won't eat it, then I won't use it. A lot of people will say when they harvest things from the garden, they'll say, well, it, it, it's like this. What do I do with it? And so, well, would you eat it now? Then go ahead and dry it. If you wouldn't eat it right now, like if it's kind of slimy and gross, then you don't dry it because you don't want to put that in your, in your pantry. Um, let's see. I have missed something along the way. Um, sorry. Paula, mushrooms rehydrated in French onion soup. Wait, I bet they would taste good. I'm just not a fan of that texture. It's just, it's me. It's just a texture thing for me. Um, Patty says her favorite projects are lime and lemon slices. Um, Patty, that's one reason why I don't add them to my very beginning projects. They are super easy to do, but people get frustrated with them turning dark so much because they don't know to turn that temperature down because they're going by what books tell them. Um, and it's one of those experiential things that if you know, you know, but if you don't, you don't, it can make those turn brown, which is the only reason I don't list them immediately. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. I'm just trying to catch whatever um, question is here between your comments. Oh, Carol, I'm glad. And I, said, I bet the soup is amazing.
Okay, so um, Annette Roberts is asking, are the moisture absorbers best for dehydrated things? Sorry for the question, it's fine. Always ask questions. Um, I just bought a dehydrator and I and I'm, I want to make sure that I use the right things rather than spending money. Okay, Annette, you don't need them. Okay, this is one of those things that uh, you don't need them. So as long as you dry properly, that you condition and that you store in properly sized airtight containers, you don't need anything more. Now, your locality may affect things. Like if you're in a really humid environment and you're in and out of those jars, you may want to use a moisture absorber because that will help keep your food fresher in the jars because your humid the humidity being introduced to yours all the time can affect things. Um, so I would use those. If you want to put things away in the shelf for long-term storage, like you're not going to open them for six or eight months, um, oxygen absorbers are used to help maintain and control the, the amount of air that's that's just inherent in a jar. So it takes it out to help prolong the life of food, um, but it's not necessary. I hope that makes sense. You can still have a very long shelf life with food without using them. It's kind of an insurance to help. So don't stress over those two things because you don't need them. Just dry properly, store properly, and you're gonna be fine. If you find that you need something, start with a moisture absorber first. I hope that helps. Okay, so um, Laura asked me, do I recommend buying the Nutri Ninja for creating powders, even if I already have a full-size Nutri Blender? Laura, uh, you can use whatever you want. The thing that I find with large size blenders when you're doing a small quantity is that you don't often get a fine enough texture or you're really working hard at it because it just can't move it the same way as if you have a smaller container. If you don't want to buy another one, don't. I mean, if it's working for you, then use it because that's what it's good for. However, on your new, on your Ninja, you should be able to buy the smoothie uh, jars that will fit on top of it. So if you wanted to invest in a smaller thing, buy a couple of the jars. If it didn't already come with it, uh, they will fit on the blade and fit right in there and you'll have that smaller container to do. Okay, let's see. Just trying to get through to make sure I'm catching questions. And um, you guys talking to me about the book, I appreciate those comments so very much. I really, really do appreciate it. Um, okay, um, Charmaine, I caught your thing. They were brown and dehydrator. Next time, turn the temperature down and make sure you're rotating trays. If you've got a stackable, if you're if you put it all in and don't rotate the trays, the ones on top get all that heat. And so they're always exposed to more heat than everything else is. So they may brown more. So if that's what you've got, make sure you rotate the trays. And if it's a regular machine, turn the temperature down next time. That should help. Okay, can, um, let's see, I may have missed something. So if I've missed your question, ask it again, but I, I'm trying to make sure I get through all of these. Can I store in Mylar bags so it will be in a dark place? Katie, yes, you can store in anything with an airtight container. Mylar, mylar uh, glass jars, good plastic, um, commercial jars, whatever is an airtight container, you can store in them. Do I need to dice garlic before I dehydrate? I want to make garlic powder. Peggy, I find that if you do a rough chop in a food processor or with your knife or whatever, uh, or with a anything that you can do, like a uh, like a slap chop kind of thing, um, I find that that is much easier than slicing it because it, does, it doesn't take anywhere near as much time. And you want to break it down because it makes it more efficient dry uh, and it takes less time for you to prep it. So I do recommend not doing them whole because they will take forever. You may have some cloves that don't dry fully because they can be large compared to the small ones. And then you run into mold down the, down the way. Okay. Sorry guys. Um, let's see the next thing. Um, Watchman on the wall ask, how do you make potato flakes? Great blanch and dehydrate or just cook mash and dehydrate. Uh, you can also bake shred and dehydrate. Okay, I mean, any of those methods will work. Um, it's whatever works best for you. So any of them work just fine. So some people, if you're talking about wanting to make them into mashed potatoes later, some people suggest that that's the best way to do it. That you start with mashed potatoes to get to mashed potatoes at the end. Um, and that way you've got that consistency that you wanted. You just don't want to add anything to it, like any kind of fats or oils, um, because that will ruin the storage later. So any three of those methods will work. It just depends on what you like to do best and what's easier for you. Okay. So the next question, 
Uh, Dawn, yeah, instant rice is so it's it's great to do. It's great to do leftover rice when you're when you're cooking to throw the extras in there while you're doing it, or to make up a double or triple batch and throw the extras in, uh, and it works really well to rehydrate. It's perfect for like doing soups like this. Um, everything in here is dehydrated. It's not ready to be cooked. It's dehydrated. So the beans are dehydrated. They were cooked then dried. Uh, the rice has been cooked and dried. Uh, all the vegetables that are in here were cooked then dried. Uh, and so everything is ready just to go right into a simmering pot. They need just long enough to rehydrate and warm up. And it's an instant soup. Not quite instant, but close, pretty close to it. Now, if I were to do this with like make these kind of things with rice that hasn't been cooked and dried or with the beans that haven't been cooked and dried, it will take much longer in the pot to get them to actually cook, which means that it's not really a great instant meal, which is what meals in a jar should be. Um, I know they can be handy to create so that you have everything already gathered so that when you're ready to make a soup one day, you just pour it in and let it simmer forever. Um, but I like the idea of making these for instant meals, for hiking, backpacking, so that you're not using so much water in the end for an emergency meal or something to give to your relatives, like some Maybe you've got elderly family that can't cook for themselves anymore or you want to give it to a new mom. Uh, it makes it so much easier for them just to put in some warm water, let it let it simmer for 10, 15 minutes and it's good to go. It just works so much better. See, Queenie, you say do it somewhere else. We don't mind it. We're good with it. I think it's one of those things that everybody has to try it for themselves to see what they think. Uh, but I know that a lot of the aromatics people like to do outside because it can uh, affect things. We don't do any peppers on the inside of the house. Um, I mean, we do sweet peppers, but not anything more than a sweet pepper. Uh, and onions tend to be outside because they can, because I do them in a big enough quantity and they can be. I don't do frozen ones outside. I do those inside, but raw I do outside because that's tip. But if you haven't heard that before, it does work. If you do frozen onions, whether you've made them yourselves, like you chopped them up and you put them in the freezer or you buy them frozen in bags, they don't smell as badly as if you do them from raw. It's a good tip. Let's see. Oh, well, Cheeky, Cheeky Sprite, we're glad to have you here. Um, yeah, um, Charmaine, you said that about changing the temperatures. Don't. Just go lower temperatures. People like, I'm not saying this about you necessarily, but people like to like, crank up the temperature some to get things to dry faster. And all you're doing really is losing some more nutrients when you do it that way. And if you do it lower, you keep more color, you keep more nutrients. It just takes a little bit longer. It's not going to make that big of a difference. Um, and so um, Lily Sprinkle asks, do you have to do, do you have to blanch cherry tomatoes before dehydrating? No, you don't. The only reason you may want to do that is to get rid of the skin. If you don't like the skin, blanch, the, you know, cut a little slit in the blanch them and it'll come right off. Um, okay, Jennifer asked, what's the most unusual thing you've used your dehydrator for or dried? Um, we dehydrated, we dried out a book. Uh, one of my husband's very favorite books had some tea spilled on it. So we had to put it in real quickly to help try to save it. Um, let's see, what else do we do with it? We, I, uh, I know I've done some other stuff like that before. Um, I don't do like really weird stuff in it, but there are tons of things that you can. People proof uh, yogurt or bread in them. Um, I mean, I would put things in to dry that got damaged and they shouldn't have been because water damages some things. And so the book was the last thing that we did. Um, I wouldn't put electronics in because the heat can somehow mess with the circuit. So I just, we haven't bothered with that. We do the rice trick first. Um, what else have I done over time? I can't think of anything offhand, Jennifer, but, um, but I do happen to have a blog post that is like some other ways that you can use it, like making paper um, and all those kind of things. I just don't tend to be that way with it. Uh, Randy, I use a spice grinder too. That's, I, I go from, a, oh, I'm sorry, try that again. I go up with the coffee grinder for small quantities, my Ninja, uh, my Nutri Ninja, which is the smoothie maker. We use it to make smoothies and I use it primarily to make a lot of powders because again, I don't make enough powders that I need my big machine for um, because I don't like to keep it that much, but I do pull out the big Vitamix because I happen to have a Vitamix. I didn't use, I didn't use to, but I did get one a couple of years ago. Um, when I do large quantities, if I'm doing greens, cause I need to stuff a lot of those greens in there because greens are the one thing that I don't save whole for the most part because we go through them so quickly. I just, I fill that puppy up two or three times, get it all powdered out and do that every couple months. Um, all right, let's see. How do you get the old smell, old smell out of a vintage dehydrator? I've tried mint, 
uh, vinegar, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Christine, you may not going to be you may not be able to because that stuff may be melted onto the the um, the heating element on the bottom may have been dripped into and that stuff is on there and you're not going to, unless you can take it apart and wash the stuff that's on the inside, because many times those old ones don't allow you to do that. And the element is on the bottom. So it gets everything put on it. Uh, you may not be able to do that. And there's also the issue with the plastic used in those times uh, was more absorbent to smells than the stuff that's new. So that may not be something that you can get out. Uh, you can try maybe drying some charcoal in it to see if that helps. Putting it out in the sun to let the sun kind of bleach it for a while. You don't want to leave it out there too long because that plastic can degrade pretty quickly. Um, but try those kind of things to see if that helps at all. Okay, so Karen asks, can you combine batches of dehydrated mushroom slices from two different sessions as long as they were conditioned properly? Yeah, as long as they're dry, they're fine. I give myself about a six month window. So after six months, I don't combine things uh, because it's just how I do it. So I'll just start a new jar. But uh, but yeah, you can combine things as long as it's all dry, you're good. Um, Got a great deal on organic mangoes it's in uh, in MC, uh, and two for a dollar. So I just finished a huge load of those, plus making raisins for my seedless grapes and tomatoes. Yeah, that's the way to do it. Uh, my my biggest thing that I do is I go scour all of the sales in the fruits. I mean, in the in the produce section. I know that we can't find them the same way now that we used to be able to. Grocery stores have had to get a little better about how the, how much they buy at a time because they can't afford the loss. But I go look at all of the I mean, every time I'm in there, I'm scouring the little, uh, we look for the, they used to be called Woohoo stickers at our grocery store chain. It's Kroger. They just have these yellow clearance stickers. And that's the first thing that I do is I go through and scour for those and see what I can get that I can fill my dehydrator up with because it's just less expensive that way. So I do that a lot. Um... I think I might have gotten. Um, Randy asks, uh, with the frost that's coming next week for them, I they are dehydrating the herbs. Do you have any videos on herb tips for processing or storage? Yeah, if you just go onto my main uh, channel page, use the little uh, magnifying glass there, and I've got mint, I've got rosemary, I've got thyme, I've got I mean, I've got quite a few, but they all work basically the same. The two differences are uh, whether you strip or not strip. Okay. Um, where you do them, uh, you can't say naked and not naked because it doesn't work that way. But when I do things that are on a stem and that stem is fairly small and the, and the leaf is fairly small, I leave them on the stem and let them dry. And then I strip them off the stem after the fact because uh, it, it, it's less mess for me that way. If they're a larger leaf, I take, this, take them off the stem first and then dry the leaves that way. So basil and... Um, uh, larger, larger leaf, things like that. I just go ahead and put the leaves in. Uh, but if I'm doing rosemary or thyme or oregano or um, even some mint, it depends. But any of those really small leaf ones, I just leave them on the stems and just pack them like crazy and dry them. They might take longer than if you destem them first, but I find it makes less mess for me to deal with if I just go ahead and do that. And I don't care that it takes a little longer because it's less thing for me to clean up because I'm kind of lazy that way. Okay, let's see. Um, Kathy says that with her dehydrator, she does uh, she dries canning jar canning jar rings. Yeah, that's a that's what I do too. Instead of leaving them out, I just go ahead and get them dried in there. Less chance for rust down the road. Um, okay, so let's see. Koa's Music Vault. Do you need to dehydrate bread first when using? A brand new machine. No, that's freeze drying. That's not dehydrating. You do want to do a burn cycle in your dehydrator first because uh, you want to burn off whatever the stuff is on the inside, which is kind of the same thing that you're doing with a freeze dryer, uh, but you don't need to ruin food. You don't have to put food in there. You just let it burn. Give it about 30 minutes on the highest temperature and just let it run. Uh, wipe it all down and you're good to go. Um, Let's see, the 79th zombie asked, do you suggest removing the seeds from jalapenos when dehydrating for making jalapeno powder? Um, no, if you don't want to, don't, because it doesn't matter. Um, fun fact, the, the biggest amount of heat is actually gonna be in that white rib, that cartilage that runs the side of it. I mean, the seeds have heat too, um, but there's just no point in it unless you are trying to get away from any amount of heat whatsoever, then you actually need to open up the jalapeno and take that rib out, take your seeds out and go. 
I dry it like it is. The seeds will fall out naturally um, and it, I don't find it matters at all. I just let them, I just keep them in there. Let me go back up here. Mm. All right. Let's see. Roaring Lion says my dehydrator is old for my broccoli. I have it at 125. Is that good? They're dehydrated right now, but boy, they sure make my house stink. Yeah. Any kind of, uh, what's the word for them? Chris, nah, I just forgot the word. There's the word for, it's not cruciferous, but it's something like that. Uh, broccoli, cauliflower, those kind of things. Um, mushrooms, um, greens all have that same kind of musky foot fungus kind of locker smell that will do that. Um, 125 for most vegetables. Uh, if you dehydrate it lower and you want to keep all of the vitamins, you do it anything under 115. Um, F, sorry, for those of you in the UK or anywhere else in the world that actually does like better measurements. Um, let's see, I'm going to go back because I'm going to forget it. It's anything under, let's see, 46 C. So that would be where you keep all the nutrients of the food. That's kind of the raw stage. Uh, it just takes longer to do. So um, yes. Uh, Debbie, your kids like to dehydrate the marshmallows once a month. That's, that's kind of fun. Hey, Susan, how are you? How are you doing? Um, let's see. I clean my bottom element with a toothbrush, baking powder, and vacuum. Uh, oh, I see. Randy, that's what he suggests. Or Randy, I'm sorry. Randy's suggesting uh, that's what they do when they clean up their, their dehydrator. Okay. Uh, Beth, the giveaway. Uh, I'm about to do one just now as like a little quick giveaway. If you're going for the dehydrators, I'm, uh, we're giving away two dehydrators. Kasori has generously donated two. And I am giving away cash for the third one for those who live outside the U.S. because Kasori can't send them. Uh, you need to go to my main channel. The very first video is the 100,000 uh, subscriber giveaway. That's where you enter uh, with the information that I need in a comment of your own, not in response to my comment, but a comment of your own to be entered. Um, in a minute, I'm going to do a little giveaway here. and I'll be just like picking a number between one and 10 kind of thing. I'll do it. Oh, gosh. Have we really gone over that long? It's 515. Holy cow. I didn't know I've been talking that long. I'm, I'm sorry I'm holding on to you guys. Okay, let's see. Let me answer whatever's left. Oh, Lily. Yes, plums can be dehydrated. You can find that on my channel and on my website. So just look at plums uh, with a magnifier. Um, just slice them, dry them at 135, and they're, they're good. Um. Kovas, you know, not because I'm trying to push myself, but I'm going to push myself here. Um, I have this nifty little book that has a lot of those tips already in it that's available on my website. It's shop.thepurposefulpantry.com. Uh, it comes in an ebook format that you can print out to put in a binder like this, or you can have your own, very own hard copies just like this. And I do ship these all over the world. So even if you don't live in the U.S., you can still get these. Okay. Shameless plug. Sorry about that. Um, let's see. Um, you don't really get the rust off cane jar rings, um, roaring lion. It's kind of hard to do and it's almost not worth it. As long as it's not touching your food, you're good. Uh, and as long as your jar lid will actually close, your ring will actually tighten. It's fine. But otherwise, yeah, you, any kind of moisture that's on them, you need to get it off immediately because they rust so quickly, which is why throwing them in the dehydrator is a great way to do it. And you don't have to sit there and do it with your towel. Um, Marshmallows are at 150, unless you're doing any kind of the colored, uh, you know, fancier marshmallows, then drop that temperature way down because they will really puff up a lot. But the regular white ones, the regular peppermint ones, uh, those can be done at 150. Um, all right, so let's go. I think we've got all the questions. I'm hoping I got them all. Good grief, folks. I didn't even notice um, that it was this late, and I'm sorry I kept you so long. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to give away some dehydrating stickers. So this is what it is. You can see just like that. It gives you all the temperatures that you can use. Um, they're, they're a little generic. Um, so like for jerky, this is the safe temperature, but you might not want to do beef that low, but this is the safe temperature so that you can make sure that you're safely dehydrating jerky at any time. Um, so this is what we're going to give away. Um, I have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Oh, how are we going to do this? Let me get fast because I didn't think about the time issue. All right. So here's what we're going to do. 
we're going to do a, a drawing numbers between a certain set of numbers and the first five people that get the right number are going to get a, a magnet, I mean, a, a sticker. So I'm going to tell you now what you need to do. If you're one of the winners, I'm going to go by what I see on my screen as the first five to say it. My screen doesn't necessarily show it what happens on yours. So you may respond first, but I don't see it first. And I'm sorry about that, but I can't, I can't adjust that and fix it. So I go by the first, oh, yay, my very first porn spam. How fun is that? <laughs> first time I've ever seen it. Okay, so I'm gonna we're gonna do numbers between 46 and 82 because that's a good small number and that just came to mind. 46 and 82. I'm gonna write it down really quickly so I can say it. I had it ahead of time. Here we go. Don't don't guess yet because I haven't even picked it yet, guys. I haven't said go. Just stop picking. Stop stop responding. I haven't even written the number down yet. I don't even know what it is yet, so you can't do it yet. So. That's not between 46 and 82, honey. My husband's over there going, it's 42. I say, no, it's not between the numbers I said. Um, okay, so I have written down the number. And when I stop guessing, guys, I can't start it until you stop guessing. So just stop guessing, okay? Stop guessing. They're just still coming through. Stop guessing. All right, when I see that they stop, then I can, then I can, can tell you. Um, Roaring Lion, you can dehydrate anything. Leaves work just like herbs do. So dry them. I mean, if you want to hang them, hang them. But um, I just, that's up to you. So if you, if they're at, here's the, the caveat. If they're edible, you can dry them. If they're not edible, um, don't dry them. Not everything that's green is edible. Okay, we've stopped now. When I say it's time, I'm a retired teacher, uh, kind of, a little bit. Um, stop guessing, guys. I, they're coming in again. Stop guessing. Just stop. They haven't stopped Cheeky Sprite. Unfortunately, they keep coming in, and I can't start it till they stop. But it may be people that are kind of catching up on the chat later if they didn't start right with this. Okay, they kind of have stopped now. So a number between 46 and 82, go. The first five people will get a dehydrating sticker. Oh, holy, okay. I have this set on slow and then it just went bonkers. All right, Tori Kidwell, you've got the first one. Email me at thepurposefulpantry at gmail.com. Tori, you've already won. You don't have to answer it a second time. I'm just going through here and trying to find them. So far, she's the only one. Terry Dean, you have won. Email me at thepurposefulpantry at gmail.com. Randy Anderson, you have won. Buffy's Bees Deals, you have won. That's four. Email me at thepurposefulpantry uh, at gmail.com. And Marnie, you're the fifth. So we're done. We've got all five of them out. So email me at thepurposefulpantry.com with your name, your email address, I mean, your physical address, and the name that you use here. Um, and I will get these shipped out to you this week. So again, guys, I appreciate you coming in. I'm sorry that I kept you so long. We were just kind of going with it, weren't we? That's an hour, almost an hour and a half. Uh, no wonder I need another drink. So again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here and being a part of this and helping create this community. I'm glad that you're here. Um, I'm glad I can help you on your journey. And I'm glad for those of you who are helping other, others out too. I appreciate your help. That's awesome. Uh, and then until I see you again next time, happy dehydrating. Have a great weekend and I'll see you later. Bye, guys.